Hello, I'm Samuel Greenfeld, and I'm here to talk to you about the Flipper Zero. Uh, this is a recorded copy of a presentation that was given to two, two groups in February of 2023. So, I'm a software quality assurance engineer in my day job. I've also been in amateur radio for roughly 30 years. Occasionally, I present at cybersecurity conferences. I do hold a CISSP certification. And I'm active in various cybersecurity groups in South Florida, including the South Florida ISSA and Hack Miami. So what we're going to do in this presentation is we're going to look at how the InfoSec community has historically looked at various things, what our Flipper Zero is, and the functionality of our Flipper Zero by area. We're going to do some live demos in this recording, and if those don't work out, we will use slides, some examples of use and abuse, and how this would all have been done before the Flipper Zero came out. Now, while many of you may think of information security as purely a computerized agenda and practice, there's a lot of overlap in people looking into computer security as well as physical security. And at most events that I'm aware of, which are not actively sponsored by a a uh, vendor looking to do potentially is more of a sales approach to their talks. Uh, there usually is a lock picking table or an even room or village at the conference, which is looking to demonstrate uh, how physical security works. Now, lock picking is kind of interesting because the basic principles of many locks have not changed in over a hundred years, and therefore. Uh, we, it is a lot of security by obscurity. You have to realize that locks are actually potentially easy to bypass. And in practice with lock picking, maybe the lock isn't the weakest leak. You may do something like knock out the hinge or something. And there are groups like the organize group, the open organization of lock pickers, or if I have that name correct, which will go into d detail on how you can do this. Uh, likewise, there's in security things, any conferences, though not as many as the lock picking, have some form of badge life. Here's a selection one blogger posted of badges from 2019. Uh, you'll notice that three of them there, the circular patch, as well as the Florida man and the Diana initiative badges, all have electronics on them for people to play around with. Uh, often there are badge hacking challenges. That Florida one badge there has a little game controller in it, all sorts of color flashing lights, an LCD display, Wi-Fi, and many other things. The little badge from DEF CON 27 there, I'd use primarily just pul pulsed occasionally in color and interacted with other badges, though you could potentially attempt to hook up to one uh, and hook it to a computer and play around with it a bit more. Um, this can get Sometimes in cases of, like in B-Sides Orlando, you can actually make your own badge. Here, their example of a group which actually lets you, uh, you can solder the long pin and the short pin on lights and other simple connectors. If they're in years they've had more complex surface mount, those are pre-done. And they actually have a whole tent outside where you can build your badge and make it light up as opposed to being a largely unused circuit board. And why does this all matter? Uh, because this is kind of like the eventual whatever thing which has happened, which is someone has come up with, there's been various devices out there, which we can may or may go into, made by vendors like Hack5 and others, which are used for penetration testing, things like that, beyond little badge challenges, actually going out in the field and working for a customer. Uh, what, but, but Flipper Zero is kind of a combination of various ones of those. It's a reprogrammable, somewhat flexible RF infrared and prototyping for hardware device, handheld, has a built-in LCD controller buttons, with a little speaker and battery and vibration motor. You can control it over Bluetooth or USB. The concept is based partially on a previous little device called a Pon Ponagachi, which was a little Raspberry Pi based device which could be used for Wi-Fi scanning and connecting network capture and it intentionally gamified it a bit by looking like a Tamagotchi toy from the 1990s 
Flipper Zero is targeted toward information security community people, primarily for penetration testing, and various hardware developers. So base tools that inclu are included with the product tend to lean in that direction. And it is an FCC certified device, so it's ideally approved for use in the United States. Uh, you can look up that ID and see all the pictures of the device and the test results online. Penetration testing is the act of physically or electronically looking for vulnerabilities, usually at the request of a third party or client. Uh, it should only be done with permission. It should only be done with a written contract and scope of engagement. All work must be kept within the written scope of engagement. This is often borderline illegal if you do not have a written scope or you accidentally go out of scope. And if additional work is desired, uh, the scope must be amended in writing. Uh, there's a bit of a theme here with the writing and getting contracts, obviously. And if you're doing a physical pen test, you should ideally carry a written get out of dear letter from someone who has the legal right to issue such a letter. And even of get, then sometimes not all the above is a bump. There was a case where there was a courthouse shared between a city and the state, and one of them requested a penetration test to be done physically, gave a scope of engagement, and the other one was not told about it. So the where was it, if there was the county, the state turned out to arrest the people for doing the penetration test, or it was, may have been the other way around. And um, it took a judge to figure out what was going on there. Uh, and occasionally you have cases where they written get out jail letter, you, they call the person and say, no, I didn't write that as a joke, and then you, they don't tend to use be that person's client again. Conversely, you may have cases where they may carry two written out of jail, jail letters, one with a false phone number on it, and they'll see if the guard figures out that someone else was pulling their leg. Well, uh, getting back to the Flipper Zero a bit, the Tamagotchi, if you remember from the 1990s and even today, was a little gamified system where you had a little pet, you'd feed it, take care of it, play with it, give it medicine, and so on. And the few models had infrared, and also uh, they had potentially the ability to do communicate with others over infrared or RF, and there were. There, it was basically a little game system that kids used to play with. This turned in a bit into the Panagachi, or at least inspired it, which is a little Wi-Fi based device, as I said, which uses a Raspberry Pi Zero to scan around for Wi-Fi networks. And if it hears them, it could also talk to other Panagachis and share the information about the Wi-Fi networks it found, as well as any handshakes of devices connecting to them, which could potentially be used to brute force and figure out what passwords were there later. Here's the Flipper Zero. As you can see, it's kind of cute looking, gamified, like the Ponagachi and Tamagotchi were. Comes with everything you need to potentially get started. Uh, what makes it unique, uh, possibly, is it it's an arbitrary RF and radio frequency recording playback device that's focused primarily on industrial, scientific, and medical bands. By the ISM bands, I'm referring to bands which are meant for low-power devices, historically industrial, scientific, and medical, but as long as you need to control your lots of devices, like your car remote or your garage remote, maybe even your RF remote to your TV or your Alexa or whatever, uh, they all... I use the ISM bands because they're freely available so long as you meet the criteria of using them. Also possibly unique is the combination of functionality, uh, the ISM bands, infrared and hardware hacking in this sort of form factor. Uh, the ability to save and restore all data from files in a micro SD card tech in text format is kind of unique. Uh, what this allows you to upload and download the data to a phone or computer for further processing. And the user data is community is probably the biggest thing here because uh, the user community is sharing data that they generated and captured. This allows other people to load the data that they did and other programs they've created onto their micro SD cards and allowing, even if you did not have the ability to capture something, 
or figure out how to do something. You might just, someone else may have already done the work for you, so you can just replay what you found that they did. And this also includes the discovery of how much technology has not changed in decades. Just like lockpicking, a lot of the stuff is actually vulnerable because, or if you want to call it vulnerable, or at least replayable, because the techniques have not changed. Uh, popularity of the Flipper Zero. Uh, originally they were hoping to get 60,000 to start these up, which may be why they're a bit limited in functionality. They actually raised 4.89 million almost. Over 150,000 are known to have been sold so far, but now it's a 50,000 person company. This used to be sold in the United States via periodic batches, put on the shop Flipper Zero One, but the shop is currently being redesigned. Uh, no current partner is willing to sh known to be shipping to the U.S. or within the U.S. In the case of the one partner I know they have within the U.S., so they don't have any stock. So ideally you want to avoid a scalper, but if you absolutely need one, you're kind of stuck with one, at least until the situation changes again. Uh, again, here's a picture of the Flipper Zero. It said black as it was an exclusive Kickstarter color. So if you see a black one, that's kind of rare, at least for them until they make them again. Optional official accessories include a silicon case, pre-cut prototyping boards, and a developer board, uh, which can be used to program or debug the Flipper Zero as it comes out of the box or do potentially other things with Wi-Fi. You can also buy plastic display detectors if you want. Here's a picture of some of those, apart from the plastic display protectors, which I don't personally have. And inside the box for developer board is, here's a picture of their Wi-Fi module. If you didn't want to just hook something on the back with the pins, you could put a wire jumper from the Flipper Zero to another prototyping board. It's mostly open source, except for certain binary blobs. So anyone can create custom firmware, and many people have. You can create custom applications beyond the f firmware. Uh, you probably have to target it typically towards a specific firmware because binary interfaces may change. And many applications read and write the text files, as said before, allowing you to their pre or post process what was done by the Flipper Zero or you can create your own custom files or download them from someone online and put them on the micro SD card for the Flipper Zero to use. Now, I know I have it in the slides, but it's a bit easier almost to go through their website and see what a Flipper Zero does, so let's do that. Here we have the Flipper Zero website. You can see it's a little picture of the Flipper Zero and how the micro SD card goes in front. Uh, you can see it, as you can see, it's a bit gamified. Uh, here's the specs. Ideally, you can just go after this presentation or through a link they'll hopefully put below and just go to their website and learn more about it. As you can see, it has USB-C, a little wrist strap hole, lots of GPIO pins, and an infrared transceiver. Uh, early design mock-ups had the infrared tr transceiver on the back of the device. Fortunately, they moved it to the side, so you don't have to worry about a board blocking your infrared. And it has, as we said, a, what's referred by the manufacturer as a sub-1 gigahertz transceiver and the ISM bands with a built-in antenna for it. It supports 100 RFID at around 125 kilohertz, which is used by a variety of primarily Identification cards just may be used for doors and other purposes. You can talk to near field communication cards and other devices, such as potentially these are more things like your credit cards or fair transit cards and things like some more things to those. It supports Bluetooth low energy to talk to its application. It supports infrared receiving and transmit. So it has the micro SD and it can be hooked up to, as they demonstrate here, to other boards for doing things like serial communication or programming a flash chip or debugging another microcontroller. It supports iButton use. It's worth, I have not personally seen any iButtons, but it's another form of access control. 
like when you use by some doors. And what's inside, here's an exploded diagram. There's various tech specs here, obviously all online. And you obviously have this eye chart you can see online is all the ways you can use the GPIO pins as well as what things internally such as various buttons are hooked to various I.O. pins. And you have a little model here if it loads which you can just spin around and look at everything on the Flipper Zero. Of course, noting the regulatory logos are a bit different than the mock-up on the back. Uh, but the official FCC certified copy has a different set of logos. You can see them in their pictures. So it, it's real. So. Well, we just went through all of this for the most part. Uh, so it can re save and replay various things or emulate. Uh, in many cases, NFC card to say emulate because you can do more than replay with them. Not all functionality is available for everything you can do with this. You can cr create certain types of devices from scratch and simulate them. Uh, you can also break MyFair Classic encryption for NFC, but it's worth noting this was first done in 2007. It's very gamified, and you, as I said, a lot of the applications are actually on the SD card, not in the base firmware. So the abilities to, of what it can do can potentially increase over time within the hardware limits. And here's all the specs again, you met, which we kind of discussed on the web page. Here's the main processor. What's worth noting that the this is only a very tiny processor in the Flipper Zero. It has one megabyte of flash and 256 kilobytes of RAM. By comparison, your your uh, home computer probably has gigabytes of RAM and gigabytes of some sort of media storage. This, the specs of this processor are much closer to your microwave than even a Raspberry Pi or other microprocessor. So this is extremely limited in what you can do because that 256 kilobytes of RAMs is millions of times smaller than what your laptop has. It's closer to maybe a Commodore 128 than anything. And that 124 kilobytes of, or one megabyte of built-in flash has to store the Bluetooth spec codecs and all the core applications and enough to get to a micro SD card to load the rest of everything else. That 32 megahertz processor is basically dedicated to running Bluetooth and part of the RAM also is actually running your Bluetooth. So as long as that's all going on, the Flipper Zero is extremely limited in what it can do. It's not like this is going to be used to capture high-speed Wi-Fi data, if that's what you're thinking you can use it for. It's more meant for a smaller, smaller sets of event capture or smaller data streams, sort of slow-speed data stream sort of capturing. Things that may differ, uh, so you might see some talk about micro SD card being optional. It's pretty much required to do anything. And communication between flippers at last check is not implemented yet, may be out by the 1.0 firmware. The firmware has not reached 1.0 yet. So initial setup, basically it says hi, uh, and tells you about itself, gives you the flippers' names, says I can learn to do more as long as you evolve, as long as you read, write, and emulate. Then it will prompt for a micro SD card if you haven't put one in there, create a database, and then ask you to update the firmware. Main screen will just quickly go through what the flipper actually does. Let's see here. So Flipper Zero, here we have the Windows control application. You can use it to upload, update the firmware, uh, install, uh, upload and download files from the flipper. Uh, can you can control what release channel, the official channels you want to see. And I said you can play games with the files. It communicates over a serial port and can relay the screen. So we're just that's just what we're going to do here. So you can see the flipper is just showing an idle animation. We can, if we hit the up button, we can lock the flipper. And then that requires us to just basically 
wake it up like that. You can set a pin and then you can use the pin to lock the flipper using the control pad to retype the pin back in. If, if you forget your pin, you will have to factory reset the device. You can also put in this dummy mode where this game controller appears. The dolphin appears on the screen and just basically lounges away and makes wise cracks. And in this mode, you basically don't have any app access to applications, which are nice. It just says it, you can put it back into Brainiac. You can see its passport or you can play a little game. Oh, it's actually not playing the game. It's interesting. There's a game there of Pong that you can play. So we put it back to Brainiac mode. Maybe I'd have, you can, the, old, the idle animation might change. They often have little one-off first steps that they do. And then they go on to doing the little ad main animation. In this view, I can, I can launch applications that I have shortcuts, or I can do various things. You can just flip through everything, all the applications you have and pre-saved files. You can just browse all the files on the micro SD card. We also have, you can go to the main middle menu, if you could call it that, and go through all the internal functionality. So sub gigahertz, it's based on the CC01 chip, as said. You can do, here's the set of frequencies it receives and transmits the United States. And it's worth noting you cannot use sub gigahertz functionality in, unless the, the device is software updated at least once. Uh, this is because a software updater will try to detect the country you're in and set a tra loud transmit frequency range. I'll just briefly demonstrate that the sub gigahertz works. I'll just uh, show you. I will open it up. I, I don't have any devices that the 7 gigahertz can read personally. So I'll just, if, if I can tell it to read raw, and I will just configure it just to show you if I set it to a, you can, the frequencies lists are fixed, though you can add them. As you can see, I added a frequency here. I can add a modulation. In this case, it knows this is for a Honda uh, car remote. So if I go back now, I can now record, and if I, push my Honda remote next to the flipper zero and click the button, or I just have it on the wrong frequency. Let's try that again. We'll try it on the other frequency for Hondas. Let's see if I can get it. If I click on it, oh, maybe you got it. Let's see if I mess it up. Or whatever he doesn't like me today. Anyway, just this is just the point that you can record, uh, even if it's not picking it up today because it doesn't want to. Uh, it can pick up on sub gigahertz stuff, and the signals can be resaved. So if I have an example of a signal, I've uh, here I can just replay an example of a signal, and it'll just that may have actually been the signal. And you just will let you replay it. And and all, you can also analyze, and then we can actually look back to what the frequency of the remote was. So that was probably what I was targeting. So if we go back here, and we do the six, six five, and we, put, we maybe put it on the other mode, see if we get a good recording out of it, and see if it maybe the, Maybe the fl maybe this isn't working because I just updated the software and the software is being slightly buggy. But that's one way to do it. Alternatively, if you have a device that's known to behave like a certain device, you can manually add it. And we can say we have a, like a LiftMaster garage door opener. We can call it. We can name this device. Come up with a cute, a cute relevant default name. And then you can just. Go to this device and we can say emulate it and it'll just go through and it will start emulating the device. And you can see how the various outputs change on the device when you do so. This just tells you the region information again, the allowed transmit range, and there's a test mode.
So we went through this. We've gone. And one thing to note is that I have not seen anything with mixed transmit receive with on sub gigahertz yet. An example where people have been playing around with this is they've been copying a file around, which is how a Tesla charge port door opens, and just opening the charge port doors of Teslas just as a joke. Although they really shouldn't be. Uh, Tesla has updated their firmware so if the, you don't plug in a charger in with a set amount of time, it'll turn around and close the door back up. So it's not as bad as it once was. Uh, this is also be interesting because there are rolling code systems that do a lot of work with these on the sub gigahertz where you're like you saw the sequence number increases and the transmit to data increases and then combine the static ID and if, if and a sequence number and potentially scramble them uh, if the correct sen static ID is always seen but you see multiple bad sequence numbers systems may presume that the receiver's idea of the sequence number needs to be changed though this may be limited within a range for an example here if a fob, key fob is seen sending 7, 8, 9, when it should be sending numbers in 400, uh, you may reset the expected ID to 10 because the battery might have been removed. Uh, so, so example, with the Honda, I believe it's actually four, four new codes have to be seen before the system will reset to realize that the sequence numbers are probably not what it was expecting. Uh, the thing is nowadays, you. So it's now seen as potentially a vulnerability, even though this is a very old concept because someone might try and capture you, you using your remote several times in a row and then they could replay it back. And if one of those at the end isn't open, they can then open your vehicle. But this concept is very old. If you remember RSA tokens and other tokens, even the tokens before they were on your smartphone and everyone was synchronized to uh, so GPS time, uh, these devices often would fall off and in an RSA system they will allow the skew to be off as by as much as four minutes and if you started skewing, uh, these, the remote was seen as starting to skew a bit, it would actually deny your first login but if you entered your correct pin along with the number appearing on the screen a second time with the next code, it would presume if two codes were correct in a row, it would then let you in because many systems would lock you out after a third incorrect retry at that point in time. Uh, an early maybe predecessor to the uh, flipper zeros, arguably the IME. As you can see here, he's using it to do another little attack and it's another little cutesy device. We can just pause the little video there so you don't have to see it 20 times, but basically this is a keyboard-based device with an LCD display which was made so kids at home could text message each other, but the list of people that they could talk to was had to be an unapproved list that their parents provided. Uh, here someone is using it for what they call, they came up with called the Open Sesame Attack, which used a form of encoding to fix uh, open fixed code uh, doors and other garage things like that in under three minutes because they were able to take advantage of a shift register in very crude systems where that like they would expect to see like five bits one two three four five but if you received a sixth bit then they'd start comparing the number against bits two three four five and six and drop the one and you can use this to create run through a lot of numbers mathematically very quickly in all possible combinations in a lot faster than you could have if the shift register wasn't there. Of note, we didn't quite show it, uh, so I'll just show it here. If you do use, try to transmit out of here, like this remote is set to be outside of the allowed transit range for the US at 390 megahertz. Uh, this, uh, if I try sending, it'll say that the transmission is blocked. But you can see how this case you have two packets going out that are scrambled by the counter and the static ID. So this is an example of a more scrambling sort of system. So you know, next we'll talk a bit about the 25 kilohertz RFD. This interacts with low frequency content tags. These might be the tags you badge in to get into your office. Presumably supports both amplitude and phase shift creating keys. 
So it can read, write, emulate, and save, and even write copies if you have a programmable badge, which you can easily get from Amazon or elsewhere of uh, building access badges. Uh, that's because these systems have not been updated in decades, really. Uh, so you can easily find all sorts of readers and programmers for them. You can read data from certain animal microchips, which may be in your pet, uh, used for finding lost pets. Some of these microchips include the ability to include temperature, and if the frequency of the tag is slightly off, uh, you may also be able to uh, still read them, but just at a bit of a reduced range, and this is using the reader on the back of the device. Uh, if you think this is illegal, uh, Home Depot and other places will happily copy key fobs, as you can see by the Wii copy key fobs located on the main little door there. Uh, there are also, if you're worried about home people seeing your face on the badge, you could just take it to an unattended kiosk. At least one of the vendors of unattended kiosks also can copy your key fobs and put them on, or key cards and put them on any little thing you want, like a little sticker that you could put on the back of your cell phone, little key fobs, key, little blank cards, and things like that as well. Alternatively, you could get purpose. purpose a base devices. I'm not going to endorse any vendor, but Keezy seems to be one of them out there that's made a lot of news, uh, usually more in a positive sense. So this is a little device with four buttons that can emulate four different ID badges. Uh, you can also buy little keys from them, and, and you can use it to write the data that it reads onto another key. Interestingly, I can have the Keezy read as a flipper zero, but the tiny little coil on a Keezy is too tiny for me to easily read with the flipper zero back. And this still doesn't support all the heavily encrypted and ciphered little uh, formats that newer badges may use. So if we go back to the flipper just real quick, we can see that we go back to the 125 RFD mode. We can choose to read one of these cards, even though I don't have one. I can, I'm willing to let you read for purposes of this presentation because it actually hit, might be assigned to something in someone's system. So if you have a saved one, you can turn around, you can emulate the card. So now it's emulating this card that it found. You can write it potentially to a blank device. There are Chinese-based ones where the user ID or, or the unique ID of the device can be reprogrammed. Uh, and so they you can to an arbitrary value. Um, and then you can then you can set that, which make it very hard to determine that it's not the clone. You can edit any existing little keys out there. If you make, I mean, if you have a little thing, you can. If you have a saved copy, you can edit the value on it. You can obviously delete them, and obviously I'm just going to delete that one for the fun of it. And you can add them. And if you have know what the values are in a card, but you don't necessarily physically physically have it, you can copy it around and just say this is the idea of the data on the card, hit save, and now you have a copy of a card that you can now emulate even if you didn't have it. Well, and some extra actions like forcing the reader to a specific mode if you want to ensure that the data is read and you are having problems with it just alternating back and forth between modes. Why is this a pro problem with a flipper potentially is, I imagine these are passed around before, but people are passing keys around. So let's see if we can get this open. Here's, if you happen to be in Russia, here's a list of intercom keys for various things converted to flipper format to get into buildings. So if you want to go to Moscow or wherever, you can see the keys. So I button keys, as we discussed with the one button interface, RFID based keys, NFC based keys. I don't know which authorities or if it's just the mail uses them in Russia, but you, the, the interesting thing about the Flipper Zero is when you have a keys, keys and you upload them somewhere, like to, people can pass them around I imagine this was done just in pure card form beforehand, but now you have a new shiny way of doing it. If you happen to spend $170 to get it instead of just spending 
uh, $10 or whatever the equivalent is in rubles or whatever and getting the key that way. So, NFC, like many things, uh, Flipper can read, write, and emulate various NFC things. The main functionality is centered around My Fair Classic cards uh, because they're so well known, at least the functionality is following. You can read, at least the type and identity of many of NFC cards, but it may not be able to do more than emulate the user ID of those cards which may be enough in many applications which just rely on the user ID to identify the user and don't care about the rest of the data on the car. Uh, it can also uh, extract the encryption keys from MyFair Classic because this the, once the, they determined what the encryption standard was, it was determined to be easily brute forceable. Although the Flipper Zero may heavily rely on its internal clock and if the clock frequency of the reading device is slightly different than the flipper zero, it may not be able to easily read it or interact with the NFC reader. Just to briefly show, here we have the NFC reader and an example of a read card you might not particularly want it to read. Here we have a American Express credit card, and it's able to tell me it's an American Express credit card. It's worth noting that it was, it was a Visa or MasterCard, which has shown me the number and expiration date. Might be possible for Flipper Zero to emulate a credit card in magnetic stripe emulation, but fortunately they have not done it, and they will not let you save a credit card at the moment. If I give it an NFC-based another token here, I'll give it a MyFair Classic device, but one without any keys on it. Oh, it didn't read it the first time. I'll try, try to see if it will read it. Oh, it's not reading it. Oh, it's picking up. I have two tokens on my thing, so I'll give it just the other one. So it sees a My Fair Classic. Uh, this is largely an empty one, so it quickly f found all the keys because there was no encryption set. And it read all the sectors of data, and you can just go through, and you can read. Here's all the data it saw, and you can go through. I can turn around and emulate the car that it just read, or I could save a copy of it. Alternatively, if I have my one way to get MyFair keys is to emulate being a MyFair Classic device. It, if this one had keys on it, I could have actually emulated that card's ID and run it against the reader and tried to extract some keys that way. Because again, we have a here we have example of a save my fair card so I can read, write the data back to it, update it, get the info about the card. We can also add manually various types of cards. Um, we can go through. Oh, in case of certain things, you can also unlock the tags like Amiibos, earlier Amiibos used by Nintendo, or my fair ultralights. And so you can find whole libraries online of my, a potential amiibos you can emulate and hook up to your Nintendo game as if you had actually bought all those little amiibos and evolved them. So, and this said, uh, this is was my fair was broken long ago. This is an article from two thousand, early two thousand and eight, uh, where they decapped the microchip and figured it out. Imagine newer microchips are a lot harder to decap because there are ways to go around this if you're trying to block it. Um, uh, some students used that knowledge that was learned to do it, wanted to do a presentation on how the MBTA protected their clipper cards in the transit system in Boston. Uh, so they got an injunction on the talk except the Slides for the talk were already included and distributed to all the people attending the talk. So that didn't work too well, and the gag order was released uh, with the help of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. But there are other transit systems out there which similarly still use my for Classic. Uh, Char my Charlie card for an MBTA, uh, at least the one I have, still uses my fair Classic. Uh, the uh, there was a system in Argentina. Supposedly, one of the most popular apps on the Google Play Store became Ad10K, 
because it added 10,000 pesos to the Argentinian transient cards that were used at the time because they were my fair classic with known keys. Uh, this is not a new thing. You can use your phone to interact with NFC devices, some of them, uh, except in certain chipsets can read my fair classic. This application is actually made by a NXP who is a vendor of, of NFC base ICs and tags and stuff. Uh, some devices, an example here of a clipper card used by San Francisco. Although it's a DES fire, so it isn't as easy to attack as my fair classic. Uh, some of the data on the device is re readable even without a key. So here's an example of it telling you how much was left in value on the card. Internally, you can write to cards from your phone as well. Or you could potentially hook a reader up to your other devices. And that's basically what I'll go into there. The infrared, a bit hard to show this on a recording, but yes, there are three infrared LEDs. Frequency is not stated. I'm just raising this because I believe there's at least two infrared frequencies that are commonly used by remotes. It has an infrared receiver as well. Some built-in universal remotes can also learn remotes or replay the IR codes downloaded on a micro SD card. So just to quickly go through that, here's your infrared functionality. So here's some universal remotes. So if I have a TV, I could tell the, the Flipper Zero to just run through all the power codes it knows about for TVs and eventually, ideally, one of them will turn off a TV. Unfortunately, there's no TVs in this room. Alternatively, I could teach it to learn a remote. So if I take a remote control, which I have here, and I just point it at it, I push the but one button, just happens on this remote, it knows it uses an RC6 sort of protocol for infrared, and the data happens to be one. So I can now save that data, and I can tell the button RC6 a one just to be quick. Now I can tell it I want to add another button to the remote. That button will happen to be two. So I'll scan it. And we have the two button now included in the remote. And we can do that, save that, and we can save that. And eventually we can just turn around and say, this is remote three is the default name for the remote. So we can rename our remote or delete our remote and do whatever we want. And go back to other remotes we've saved. You can tell I've been given this presentation a few times. Alternatively, you have a little debug mode for infrared. Oh, this is slightly interesting because I can't prove this actually occurred, but here is an example of someone modifying a gas pump to return that the uh, gas costs 10 cents a gallon. Now, gas pumps can be programmed with infrared remotes. However, a lot of these videos are believed to be staged, so I cannot prove that someone has actually done something illegal here. Also, so sometimes the gas stations are actually in on the act as an example of the script that I will talk to which this user got confused. Uh, but between the infrared functionality and someone changing the gas sign, which is actually RFID. Uh, but it's worth noting this, is, this occasionally does happen, but it's extremely rare because obviously the back end of the gas station knows that someone just bought gas, ridiculous amount of gas, ridiculously cheap, or, and they just go back and see who happened to be in the gas station in the moment, and often they can trace back who was doing it by their license plate and other information. Here's an example out of the UK of someone selling an infrared remote for various gas fuel pumps. Um, I so said the gas stage signs, here's an example, I was told it's probably from the United Kingdom with someone just capturing raw data from a gas pricing stain, spotting that the, st looking at the unit, figuring out it had some a soldered ba on based ID identifier. So these gas stations can have different identifiers. So it's not like you can just raw do it. But he was hoping that someone else might just make something that could control it and they could potentially you, then be additional functionality you could do with a flipper. But really all you need for infrared purposes uh, is you can go online, download your remotes. Uh, people have, really this is something 
people have had universal remote databases for a while. These just got converted to the flippers format. Nothing really new here. So these, just like your remote controls that are programmable online, you can do it, have used these databases. You can go look at these, look at your Blu-ray or whatever device and just say, oh, who's the manufacturer? And just get all the data on how, for your flipper zero on how to do things. So, on, um, and beforehand, you, you had the flipper, you could have just used a universal remote control. These are probably a lot cheaper than a flipper zero and many of them support programming. So, let's see what we did here. General purpose input and output, those pins on your back of the flippers are referring to GPIO pins. They're all based on 3.3 volts, though they support inputs of 5 volts, have some, I believe, some limited ESD protection for against shocks. They can be set up in a variety of modes, as you can see all by the chart on their website. Without an application, uh, built in USB ser uh, serial port emulation and manual control are offering. And there's a five volt reference output that has to be turned on if needed. Otherwise they think it's a bit of a battery drain. So if we go to the flipper, you can see we have our GPIO. I can turn on this. If this wasn't hooked up to serial port, I could just do it that way. And, but it says I'm doing, using serial for this. Alternatively, I can manually turn pins on and off and using the little button in the middle. So I can change the change what pin I'm looking in and see what the pin is doing. And said so you can control the five volts. Of note is that somebody said on the website said, oh look, I can use it to control traffic light preamps by using a series of infrared LEDs a little optical copter, basically a very fast on-off switch, and controlling that on-off switch using the flipper zero set to 14 hertz. But you don't need a fancy clock generator or even a flipper zero to generate a 14 up on-off cycles per second. You could use something like a what's referred to as a 555 integrated circuit, which is a very tiny IC chip you can buy for less than 80 cents, maybe even 50 cents. And you can, here's an example from Electronics Hub, though there's many other websites which would show you there's many circuits which you can use to generate uh, on-off uh, square waves and arbitrary on-off rough rectangular waves using one or more 555 ICs. This, which I said, are very cheap. You can even buy a 556 with two built in and pay maybe even 80 cents. It's not as much as buying two of them. And as someone pointed out in one of the groups I'm in, uh, you can buy little kits to build your own 555 IC using transistors and resistors and just to learn about how they work because these, are, I, these have existed since the 1970s. They're not very new technology. Just to show Flipper Zero because we can quite touch on that. Or let's see. Or is it? It's interesting. It's not showing me. There. I guess they move the functionality, or at least because I'm on a newer firmware. And there used to be the timer controls, and here though they may have moved it to applications. I'm guessing. So if I go here and go to signal generators, so I was saying I could generate a very high frequency clock on a GPIO pin, or I can go to the pulse wave generator, and I can say here I just want to go. If you get 14,000 hertz, I want to go to 1 hertz and I'll, I could just create a 14 hertz signal this way and say it's, for a square wave, I would just say it's 50 hertz modulation. So. I button, uh, these are access control systems. Use a key that looks a bit like a button cell battery. These are also referred to one wire devices. You can read emulate these using the contacts on the bottom flipper, which are also hooked to the GPIO pins. As we saw before, you can find libraries of these on online as well as re rewritable buttons. So you can set these up. I'm not really in much of a position to 
demonstrate that because I don't have any devices I can hook up for you. But to show you just setting JS, you can read them. You can, if you have a saved one, you could replay it. And if, if you want to, you could manually add one and say, this is my I button. And then you can emulate it or whatever you want with it. So bad USB. Uh, this is a fancy way for stating that you never know what a device is going to do. So if you, this case, the Flipper Zero is used to emulate a USB keyboard, automatically typing data from file, uses a similar ducky strip format to older Rucker ducky hack five devices with a bit of a different feature set. And so, uh, I'm told this is, well, just they say it's taking a, well, the website implies that they support only an older subset. They've started to add a newer functionality that rubber duck support as well. Somewhere I have an old advertising phone which does this, I believe actually for McAfee, where you would plug it in, it would try to hit the Windows run key, and then type in a URL it wanted to go to. And at least one third party flummer can do this over Bluetooth, where it emulates a Bluetooth device of the ID and name that you specify. And when they connect pair to the device, it can then be used to type on it like it was a keyboard. So to just quickly do this, I can't keep the serial console open. But if I run to bad dish E, I go to demo windows and I hit run on this, it'll open up notepad and now the flipper zero is now typing away on my computer and showing off that it can do so. So. As said, the Rubber Ducky is the inspiration for this. As you can see, this micro SD card actually can be used to copy data back onto itself by emulating things in various modes. Uh, universal two-factor, it's worth knowing this is a way to log into websites uh, with using a physical device as an additional authentication method. It attempts to use a device in specific encryption keys so UTF files cannot be copied from one flipper to another. Now this is not meant to be a certified secure device. This is implemented in software, not hardware. But some websites uh, won't let you use the Flipper Zeros. They require Microsoft especially, I think. Windows logins up prior to some patch level, you could have used a UTF key like a Flipper. But now they want FIDO2 based devices or UTF plus certain extensions. UB keys are a great example of 502 keys. They come in consumer as well as fancy corporate ones, which will do additional programs. Alternatively, just plain UTF, but not 502. Google has their Titan keys, and you can find lots of other brands are Amazon. So just giving you an example of what happens here, because you can use Google example of like, if I try logging into my uh, one of my Google accounts, see if this is capturable or not. If I try signing in with a password to one of my accounts, uh, it, uh, I have Google configured to require a UTF key. You can see here it's now prompting for a UTF key to be tapped on the uh, somewhere on the computer or inserted to a USB port. So if I find where I put my UTF key down, if I was to now insert in, although I will not actually do so, it'll say, oh, I put my UTF key into to the computer and say, touch your security key. So this is an actual confirmed uh, uh, request. So you can't just override it without be, so, doing something with the key. And then it'll log me into Google's to website. Uh, Google is especially nice for this because they support putting your account in a mode where if you enable UTF or at least on one device and maybe you, you're a phone as a secondary authenticator, uh, you can lock down your Google account so it's impossible to log in via any means unless one of those devices is present. Otherwise, you have to spend a few days going to Google in person and attempting to get this resolved the, so you can log in again. This is not necessarily an evil functionality, it's actually a good functionality for a YubiKey to have. So.
applications. There's lots of applications. The latest firmware actually sorted them into folders. It's recommended at least at one point if you clear your application folder out if you change firmware branches because they change potentially the binary interface on how you talk to your flipper. Here's a list of included applications currently in the current firmware. It's a DAP link. If you have another uh, microprocessor you want to talk to, you can use uh, there's a JTAG debugger. PicoPass is a kind of a high frequency, low frequency combination. Uh, little uh, identification system for doors. Uh, so I believe it's HID and DALAs are supposedly those. It's, that, it's shown you have a signal generators. You can read various web stations. And if you have SPI flash chips, uh, you can hook up to those. For purposes of this talk, I'm not necessarily going to go through all of these. As you can see, if we just go to the Applications folder on the device, here's our list of applications now supported like things. It said you have a Bluetooth remote you can use to control the computer. You have all your little tools, games, media, just tools, just a little clock, as you saw before. And you have a little music player. The Flipper Zero can play music, but it's nothing home to write about. So it just plays tonal music. Worth noting, someone has written a, if you're into Amiga's old mod music format, someone has written a module music player for the Flipper Zero. However, they were hook at it, outputting out the GPIO pins to a headphone jack or speak or line out or similar. So they were, they were not just using the internal speaker for their module player. And there is, if you want, a mobile app, which will, as you can see, it has the name of the Flickr Zero, in this case is Lyum. Uh, it lets you update the firmware, it synchronizes all the data off of the flipper. In fact, it's the first thing it typically does. You can use it as a bit of a fl find my flipper because it will play an alert on the device. You can also mirror the screen, though that's currently a bit experimental. And it said we have the Wi-Fi developer board. It's an expressive ESP32 based processor with its own dedicated radio. Uh, you may, worth noting, this is completely independent of the Flipper Zero. If you just provide this thing power and used it USB port, you could use it perfectly on its own. Uh, the Florida Man badge I showed you earlier uses an expressive 32 to do all the control of the entire device, including all the game on the serial port and 20 other things. It was do, doing at the same time, fetching data over Wi-Fi um, to update information to show to the user and weather and other things. You may hear of the Marauder firmware being used in ESP32 uh, in place of, a, of the debugging firmware. Now this existed before the Flipper Zero, it just takes commands over a serial bus and takes advantage of the fact that ESP32 is a very low level Wi-Fi device and can be used uh, like certain even, uh, though rarely available, you can get potentially a certain uh, Wi-Fi boards for a computer would also potentially allow you to send arbitrary packages just like the ESP32 does. But when paired with a flip it, uh, flap application, you're now controlling it over a Flipper Zero and and they modify the feature set slightly, so it expects to be controlled by the Flipper Zero on the Flipper Zero's included development board. Work in progress, there's a huge user community making lots of add-ons, programs, graphics, firmware, etc. Some of these are safe for work, some of them are not safe for works. Some of them change out the dolphin for some other character like a Sasquatch. At one point in time, they were talking about making a Flipper 1 that this page has since been taken down. There was going to be a bigger Flipper Zero that was based on the Raspberry Pi Zero, You're running a pen testing Linux distribution known as Kali Linux. In some ways, it may have been stronger or weaker than the Flipper Zero if they decide to actually implement it uh, because they Flipper Zero is able to do arbitrary UID emulation, but they wanted to use some Win Linux libraries that do not currently allow you to arbitrarily set the UID of a device, which is kind of important when you're trying to mimic the device in case you're trying to fool the other side. Are there any uses that earn evil? Well, yeah, 
you have to you could use it in infrared remote or is that a UTF token? But a flipper has to interact with someone, something. And for many people, this is a learning device. I know I brought in the gas station example because I do know a gas station attendant who actually is interested in getting one of these things. It's they want that viral on TikTok and other platforms. But the problem is that without beyond personally owned home devices, you'd have to come up with other things a user could interact with. Uh, this is very much a way people are learning about how low frequency RF and whatever things IR and many other things around them behave and how they largely work on standards which can be mimicked by other devices. Uh, if you're trying to protect yourself from a flipper zero, there are various things you can die. Primarily, you need to check on the back end for data, which may be slightly off, such as multiple cards doing the same thing too often, uh, or out of cards getting out of sync with what the database has, the incorrect UID for the data, or some some crazy things can try and do radio signature checks, so that's a bit hard. Or you need to really update to newer equipment, which uses encryption or other coding, which has not been hacked yet. Realize that some of this is intentional behavior, said the rollbacks. Though now, no, I know Honda may be looking to tell their supplier for RF remotes not to do the rollbacks anymore. In um, one case, someone told me they tried a rollback attack against their manufacturer of vehicle and actually temporarily bricked their com thing without the dealer helping them undo it because the embedded controller in their car wasn't designed to tolerate that. Uh, but... Uh, in general, this equipment has often been around like 20 plus years and while you may gradually roll out like newer ID cards or something, uh, you may have a lot of older ID cards and you may just not be updating your readers because if you update your readers to say to a, a homeowners association or other, you may have to hand out a thousand new cards and that's a significant expense if you want to force everyone to use the new equipment or once as opposed to using dual track or just gradually gradually upgrading them over time. Amateur radio impacts. Uh, if you gave this once to an amateur radio group, people are inter introduced to how radios work. I said it has a sub gigahertz transceiver, can mimic like your garage remote or things like that. You can use it as a small handheld controller with a microcontroller. Someone has written a Morse code decoder for it. Or you could use the GPO to control possum dots. Potsack paging, which is legal to decode in the United States, though sometimes not in other countries, is possible with this device. So you could potentially use it as an arbitrary audio-based terminal node controller uh, if someone wanted to build an app to do that. Uh, you could use the 2.4 GHz radio potentially as long as you can constrain yourself to amateur radio bands for amateur radio purposes. It's worth noting all the antennas on the device are internal. By default, you would have to actually physically open the device to try and add an external antenna. And the over the receive range of the sub gigahertz does overlap at least two amateur radio bands in the United States, but you cannot transmit there without using third-party firmware that overrides the restrictions that are included in the uh, official firmware that keeps it legal for use by the average user in the United States. Uh, it does support extended transmit receive beyond the chip specs, but that's said to be at your own risk. I don't know why they think the author of that firmware thinks it'll potentially damage the device. It's also unclear how clearing of a signal you'll get if you're going beyond the default transmit ranges. And from an amateur radio perspective, it's also worth noting a lot of people playing games with sub gigahertz and playing with these other firmwares may. A lot of them are not aware of the Federal Communications Commission's would think if they are going to do things that are potentially slightly illegal, they don't necessarily care because they think the FCC is going to come out or the appropriate authority in your country is going to is not going to care about small people just playing around with little radios at low power doing things that they should not be. They're going to be much more interested in people interfering with TV and radio stations, which are or putting pirate radio stations on the air and things like that, unless you really, really do something to drive someone nuts. Here's some links I put in here for purposes of the presentation. And for awesome Flipper Zero, 
is just a database of uh, Flipper Zero websites and other informations and firmware. So here you can find all the legal things and illegal things you can potentially do. Flipper Zero is said, uh, I think, Flipper Zero was inspired by, partially inspired by Hack5 devices. So if we go to their website, you can see here, you can see the original rubber ducky and a lot of other devices which can be used for penetration testing. Some of them are designed to look a bit obscure or hard to spot, especially the cables, which are malicious but include evil microcontrollers in them. So, and that's basically the presentation I have. So here's another, not, you can use Google Auth Flipper as an authenticator, so it generates TOTP codes just like Google Authenticator. So that would be another legitimate use. And that's all I had for the purposes of this recorded talk. So th thank you.